All right, welcome back to We Play Games. I'm Walker, and here we are in Her Majesty's Government playing our retrospective. So you'll note that I actually, in my enthusiasm to start on 1.2, I actually lost the, the end of game uh, save file, but I did have a backup from 1895. So we're, we're just going to look at the numbers here in 1895 with the caveat that they, they're a little different in 1898 when the game actually ended. Um, but we do still have Queen Victoria, so that's fun. We can talk about her reign. So right before the end of her life um, and the, the end of Austria-Hungary, which was one of the last things that Queen Victoria achieved during her reign, we had built up a really interesting economy and a, a fairly, fairly normal set of laws. But the implications of the way in which we played the game and the implications of the way in which we interacted with the other countries in the game, especially vis-a-vis -vis our market, had some pretty profound effects on some of the nations. Because some of the nations are like, what is going on here in Norway? Why is this just like bright white? Well, it's because here in Norway, the population has collapsed. And that's something I, I think we can talk about here in Her Majesty's Government, that there are some serious sociological implications um, to economic imperialism in Victoria III. Whether they're good or bad is just kind of up to you, uh, but they are serious. Like, some of the nations that we were struggling with, with all the rebellions, like we ended up having to annex Belgium, we've reduced Netherlands to a puppet, there have been multiple revolutions in Norway, multiple revolutions in New South Wales, but but when you look under the hood and you actually look at like what's happening in these countries, it's pretty stark and it's pretty understandable that like, oh, no wonder this country is having problems. Being part of the British market is devouring their society. And I think that that's kind of fun. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about here in this episode. We'll also talk about some of the specific mechanics of Victoria 3. Like I want to highlight why we have some unincorporated states, the political implications of unincorporated states. I want to talk about free trade a little bit, but we'll we'll also just like look at some of the numbers. With 1.2 here, some of this stuff that we've done in Her Majesty's government might not necessarily be replicatable, but I think that you can do something pretty similar in regards to utilizing bankrolling to expand peacefully, because that's, that's what we did here, right? Literally the only thing that we took was Eastern Mali. All of the people who are puppets now are puppets of their own accord because they had revolutions and made us uh, put them down, like the Netherlands and Brazil are both our puppets because they just were having stability issues. And we have a lot of protectorates and a bunch of people in our customs union. And so what that's meant is that over the course of this 19th century, there's been a lot of population exchange without necessarily as much land exchange. You'll note just like looking around the map, there are literally more states on the map now in 1895 than there were in 1836. And it's just because like we a, we haven't really been annexing a whole lot of people, um, and B, we have been force releasing a lot of people. And of course, we've kept uh, Germany at bay by beating up Prussia enough and allowing Austria-Hungary to become Austria-Hungary. But from a macro perspective, our strategy was to bankroll people and then use obligations to buy them into our customs union. But the way that that works, of course, is that you need to be able to you need to be able to hit a, a good acceptance score. And one of the things that holds your acceptance score back is infamy. So we really couldn't afford to have just tons of infamy if we wanted to be relying on bankrolling. But the other thing that you that we can be doing of course, um, is trade. And so trade here in Victoria 3, I think is kind of not understood. So let's talk about trade. First, when it comes to trade, um, when you're in mercantilism and protectionism, yes, you are getting tariffs and you're not getting them as free trade. That said, I still think that free trade is generally speaking going to be strong for basically anybody who has reasonable access to ports because of what it does vis-a-vis -vis your construction. So in Victoria 3, um, there are some things that are like definitively different from everything else in the same category, right? In buildings, there are a handful of buildings that literally don't cost construction points to increase or decrease and will instead do so on their own. So trade centers here are going to increase and decrease with the size and profitability of the trade routes that you have funneling through it. That's going to increase the productivity, that's going to cause them to increase their workforce to meet the requirements of their trade routes. If their trade routes are expandable. At one point here with Her Majesty's government, we had our trade center in home counties up to 200 something productivity. It's not there now, of course, because there just aren't a lot of independent countries on the map that we're 
conducting trade with. Um, most people have been absorbed into the British or the Austro-Hungarian market. But this trade center, when it's on free trade, is going to be running privately owned, which is going to have increased employment for capitalists and clerks. And you'll see they're getting paid a dividend. And because these guys are getting paid a dividend, that means they're also paying us laissez-faire investment pool. And so if you're going to have laissez-faire on um, and you have easy access to the coast, then you really should prioritize getting a construction industry up first, but then you should probably prioritize getting a trade industry up second because a trade industry is very powerful. It's extremely efficient in terms of the trade route bureaucracy cost, but it's also extremely efficient in terms of just getting people out of peasantry and into good jobs that do something for you as soon as possible. Um, these are extremely efficient to set up in terms of employment per bureaucracy and convoy, especially once you're in free trade, because trade route competitiveness and volume means that you're going to be able to capture value really well. But don't think about free trade as the tool that you need to be in if you're looking for a specific resource. Specific resources are mercantilism and protectionism. I think that generally speaking in Victoria 3, they are weaker, they're specialized, and you could potentially get a little bit of extra money here in terms of our, our tariffs, right? If we were in protectionism, and we'd have 400,000 more in terms of our tariffs. But our national revenue is 10 million. That, that just like straight up doesn't matter. That is a literal drop in the bucket. And it's a literal drop in the bucket due in part to free trade. Because some of, some of these trade routes are pretty stupid large. Like we have a size 54 clothes export to Great Ching. We have a size 85 clothes export to Austria-Hungary before we blew them apart. And that's actually just like pure upside for us, right? Because what this means is the productivity of our textile mills has gone up because people are buying those clothes. I don't care that that means that the people living inside the United Kingdom have to pay very slightly more for clothes. That should not matter to you because if they're paying very slightly more for clothes but are getting paid twice as much, their standard of living is going up. This isn't like the highest standard of living in the absolute universe, um, simply because we have a absorbed India. That's like what happened right here is we annexed the EIC and now we've been building them out of poverty. But generally speaking, trade is going to be useful for you in Victoria 3, because in the mid to late game, at least with the way the AI is currently working right now, you're going to start running out of demand for goods. And that means you're going to need to find demand somehow, and one of the easiest ways to find demand, of course, is to pick up subjects. And one of the like most cost-effective ways to pick up subjects is actually bankrolling. Bankrolling is really sweet when you're a, a big power, because it's going to give you access to some really interesting things. Let's look at Norway. So Norway, you can see here, their population has declined to 70,000. One of the problems for Norway was that they were part of the British market, but they were under Sweden as part of a personal union, so they couldn't really get away, but they also just like could not build their economy large enough, fast enough to keep up with everything. And so what ended up happening was people started leaving Norway. You see that big drop in population that looks like a civil war. But I'm certain what happened here, just looking at this, is that they had a civil war um, and then they had just devastation throughout their country. So whenever there's fighting in a state, uh, you inflict devastation on the state, which is in turn going to damage all of, the, all of the state modifiers here, including decreasing migration attraction. And so what happened as a result of that civil war was massive devastation in Norway. People left the country. And then when people started leaving the country, they, the buildings that had been built up had difficulty employing people. And then they just sort of collapsed all around them. And as more and more people left Norway, the buildings that had been constructed had a harder and harder time actually functioning, especially because there were some pretty massive swings in terms of uh, prices here in Her Majesty's government inside of our market. Um, like any time we absorbed a, a state in India or in China, that was a massive increase to the size of our economy just in terms of the number of pops in the, the, the market. And so I'm sure that that also had some knock-on effects to the, uh, the standard of living here. But the standard of living for Norway really just, it built up alongside the market and then it had a civil war and then devastation caused them to 
enter into a migration death spiral. But sometimes the civil war isn't the cause of the migration death spiral. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes the migration death spiral causes the civil war. So very recently we had a revolution in Spain. But when you look at the population of Spain and you recognize the fact that Spain has also lost control of Cuba and the Philippines, although we did manage to bring them back into our market, but Spain's population has also been drained pretty significantly. And anytime you see that sort of massive drain in population, you have to understand that yes, they still have peasants, but not every state is going to be affected the same way, right? Some of these states here in Spain are at insignificant peasants and unemployed and have been there for a very long time. Ah, yes, and you can see here, devastation on Spain. They they don't have as much anymore because it has been a little while since the Civil War ended, but that devastation, I'm, I'm sure, along with the turmoil, has hurt uh, the population locally and encouraged lots of migration out. And the way I'm sure of that, of course, is that if we look at where Spanish people live, population in Great Britain, 7 million. Population in Spain, 7.8 million for the entire country. In Norway, 70,000 people in the entire country, regardless of the culture. There are 461,000 Norwegians living in Great Britain. But not every society was affected equally here in the game. And I think that part of that is due to the fact that some of these countries just had larger and more complicated economies set up. But I think also part of it is simply due to the way that we have our unincorporated land set up. So one of the most important things in Victoria 3 right now is the delineation between incorporated states and unincorporated states. So we made a, a deliberate like lore choice to not incorporate the entire empire, but it also had some economic implications um, for us. So unincorporated states are pretty meaningfully different from incorporated states. Unincorporated states, first, they have all of these modifiers down here. Minus 33% minimum expected standard of living means that it's actually a lot easier to get people well above their expected standard of living, which means that you can build loyalists in unincorporated states a little easier. You do not have access to institutions, however, because you don't spend any bureaucracy there, you don't collect taxes, but no institutions means that you do need to expect more revolutions in those areas because you don't have police to combat turmoil. You don't have National Guard to combat turmoil. And you also have this minus 25% malice to infrastructure. So like, why would, why would we want unincorporated states? Well, it's minus 50% universal pop political strength. And what that means is, if I have a desperate need to build a whole lot of agricultural buildings, because I need those resources to funnel into the industrial buildings back in, in England, that I should build those agricultural buildings in unincorporated states. Because now you see we have this 101 level opium plantation in South Bengal that's giving 10,000 aristocrats a lavish standard of living. But our landed gentry here in Her Majesty's government is at 1.5% clout. Despite the fact that these are not just like, you know, pitiful, tiny economies, 182 million GDP in South Bengal, 200 million in North Bengal, 129 in Delhi, 155 in Bihar. By comparison, Great Ching at this point is down to 139 million GDP. And so we actually built several states in India up to having a, a statewide GDP larger than Great Ching's. But we still haven't drowned out the political power of our, our home counties. Part of that, of course, is that the GDPs here back in England are also ridiculous, like 300 million, 200 million, 267, 187. But the other thing is, of course, unincorporated states are going to encourage pops to be politically inactive. They don't vote either. So this is a really big way to sort of shape the economy and the society that you want to build in Victoria 3. I think ultimately most nations are going to need to build both agricultural and industrial buildings. But if you wanted to build an economy that was more agrarian, then of course you'd want to flip the script on the head, right? You'd want to build all of your agrarian buildings at home and all your industrial buildings away. But the, there is a kind of problem with that. Specifically, unincorporated states get minus 25% infrastructure, which you can kind of get around by trying to maximize the infrastructure on your railway and your unincorporated states, so don't run anything above cargo prioritization. And if you can afford it or want to, you can run electric trains too. But urban buildings use a lot more infrastructure per level than agricultural buildings. Agricultural buildings all use one infrastructure per level. 
Urban buildings, on the other hand, are going to cost two or three per level. And so what that should tell you is that generally speaking, just in order to be efficient in regards to your infrastructure in the world in Victoria 3, there is a natural mathematical pull towards building your industry in incorporated states and your agriculture in unincorporated states. There are also benefits, of course, that the, uh, the territories in question don't pay taxes if they aren't incorporated, and so if you're building a massive GDP uh, in a, a specific state, you probably want to be taxing that state. But I, I say only probably, because South Bengal is doing very well for itself. Um, its migration attraction is really high, despite having a penalty from oil rush. And part of that is just there's a lot of really good jobs here. The standard of living is very high, and the standard of living is very high despite being on colonial exploitation, because colonial exploitation gives you an extra reason to want unincorporated states. It does have a subsistence output and starting wages penalty, so only switch in to colonial exploitation if you're willing to invest construction points in your empire. Otherwise, colonial resettlement is much better, a plus 100% migration attraction means that we can kind of destroy societies the way we did for Spain and Norway and the Netherlands. The poor Netherlands, look at what happened to them. But not every uh, country within our, our sphere was devoured. Some actually joined us in the feast. Like, look at what happened in South America. Look at the standard of living in Peru, Bolivia. Look at the population of Argentina, right? These nations have done very well for themselves by attaching themselves to the British market. And Peru, Bolivia even has built away most of its peasants. Unfortunately for Peru, Bolivia, they still haven't, like, maxed out their oil rigs or anything like that. One of the more interesting things for me, though, uh, in Peru, Bolivia, is the nature of their government. So it's a military dictatorship uh, with armed forces in control. They've got some pretty extreme political movements moving on in the background, but they still have state religion on the books. And as you'd expect, of course, that means that Peru, Bolivia is just, like, overwhelmingly Catholic. Ah, and there are some Spanish living in Bolivia. So looking around the world, we can also kind of, like, see where the Spanish people are living in a... Her Majesty's government. So Spanish, for instance, have resettled largely in Patagonia. Relatively small numbers of, of Spanish living here, but in basically every state. Enormous number of English people living in home counties. There are 60 million English people in Her Majesty's government, and 11.8 of them are 11.8 million of them are living in home counties. But because of our recent annexation of the East India Company, when we go down to look at our culture map, Wow, just look at the the massive distribution of people living within Her Majesty's government, within the borders of our empire. But then, of course, the political strength, yet again, this just highlights the importance of understanding unincorporated versus incorporated uh, states. If you want to specifically enfranchise specific interest groups, be aware of the economies that you're building. Um, be aware of the, the population that you're employing. In the religion as in the culture we have actually the the largest plurality is hindu but the majority of political power is in the hands of the protestants and that's not due to discrimination exclusively although it is of course partially due to the fact that we are in freedom of conscience versus total separation but because culture is telling you the same story that there's just not a little a lot of political power in the hands of uh people living in india and that's understandable because they're not living in incorporated states. Of course, the uh, the global GDP map here, it kind of tells the same story as, as you'd expect with economic imperialism. But again, we, we have built up India quite a lot. But one thing that was a little disappointing for me, at least, um, was just to watch some of our, our Chinese puppets or protectorates really struggled to make use of all the extra resources that our technology made available to them. But some of them really did prosper. Like Mongolia, pretty clearly, did very well for itself in its, the generation that it was part of the British market. Its we weekly GDP basically exploded. And it's not even really doing anything particularly creative with its construction, but it is doing a lot of livestock ranches. And as it turns out, because of the, the way that they've set up their livestock ranches, um, producing f fertilizer that we are using and meat that our market is buying, uh, Mongolia has done pretty well for itself. And Japan, of course, uh, is a very interesting state here in Her Majesty's government or the world that it created, um, simply because it has flo it's continued to hold on to its shogunate and hasn't really industrialized. 
but it has leaned very heavily into its agriculture sector. And simply by having access to a lot of the construction goods within the British market, or the Russian market when it was briefly there, it's been able to build away a good chunk of its peasants. Um, but make no mistake, in terms of the political makeup of this country, it is still largely an agrarian society. Looking around at standard of living, you can see there, there actually are some countries that are doing pretty well in terms of their own SOL here. Honduras and Nicaragua have done incredibly well since joining the British market, and their populations have grown, as well as their GDP, and that's just pure resource extraction for them in uh, Nicaragua, right? Their economy is 100% logging camps and, and agricultural stuff. But because our economy in the UK is going to be largely prioritizing industrial things in our incorporated states, that, that's a good place for Nicaragua to try to find efficiency for itself. They have lots of laborers, so a lot of, lots of automation that they could still do if they wanted to drive their numbers even higher. But they're doing, they're doing pretty well. It looks like Honduras is largely doing the same thing, but they have begun to industrialize, right? They're building an arts academy, they're building a tooling workshops, and their trade unions are starting to move up in the world there in, in Honduras. Still, mar still very, very marginal in Nicaragua. Now, this was different um, by 1898 because we did cut Austria-Hungary down to size, um, but the general distribution here is going to be pretty similar. Right now, we're third in terms of total SOL. Hamburg is actually above us. Hamburg being part of our customs union and having basically just built a little bit of furniture. That's about it. They, they're furniture and tools. But that's a, a really powerful way to make use of a, a big market like this as a subject if you're not going to be able to specialize in agriculture because you don't have any arable land. You could specialize in resource extraction on the small plots that you have and in industry because industry is one of those things that's pseudo unlimited. But then there are some other more curious things here, right? Like Hanover, for instance, has actually had its standard of living increase pretty considerably uh, as it's joined the British market, but it's also had its population decrease, all while watching its GDP massively increase. And so there are some things, some stories here within the game that I don't know if I really can actually analyze, because I'm not sure why uh, Hanover was having so many, my, so many people leave. Looks like they might have just been having turmoil because turmoil is one of those things that, at least in 1.1, the AI does seem to struggle with managing. But there is one thing that I want to highlight as to how we were able to build home counties in East Anglia and all these guys so far above their, their overpopulation camp, cap. And it's just because we were overbuilding buildings. Um, if you don't have enough peasants locally to actually staff a building, you can go ahead and actually build a little bit over the number of employable pops. And what'll end up happening, of course, is that the buildings will compete with each other in terms of wages. And that increase in wages, because they're all trying to maximize their own profit, and if they could be more profitable by hiring one more person, they'll hire one more person. Um, and then they have to compete against each other for the limited number of pops, increases the wages, and that increase in wages is gonna increase your local standard of living in a way that's gonna have a productive increase to your migration. Apparently this has been buffed in 1.2, but in 1.1 it was still very powerful and very easy to utilize um, overbuilding in order to encourage migration. I think as a retrospective on just like utilizing free trade, of course the, the thing that's like critical here is just capture productivity. Don't worry about all the other stuff. Productivity is the reason that you're in free trade, right? I don't, I don't care about the standard of living knock on on liquor. I don't care about really anything except for capturing differences in prices and translating that into money for people working in the trade centers and therefore translating that into investment pool and like real jobs that I don't have to spend construction points on. But let's talk very briefly about Austria-Hungary before closing the book on Her Majesty's government. So I think it's more useful to do it here in 1895 than in 1898 after we'd, we'd blown it up. But I think just looking at the nation that the AI built here for Austria-Hungary is, is going to be interesting to look at nonetheless. First of all, you should know, obviously, this GDP is very small for Austria-Hungary in 1895, despite being the second largest in the world. That's still pretty anemic um, for a great power at, at game start. But their standard of living is not doing poorly. But it seems like right now what they're struggling with is just a lot of really low productivity buildings. And those extremely low productivity buildings, of course, mean that they haven't been advancing their construction sector a lot. 
and they're still kind of at the point where their economy is not utilizing maximum methods of production. Yeah, they only have 21 construction sectors on steel right now, and they're at maximum gold reserves. Oh, excuse me, they're at way over maximum gold reserves while having a general strike in effect. But that said, the AI is still conducting some trade all on its own. You see here, they're actually importing 38 levels of clothes from Great Qing. If you'll recall, we're actually exporting tons of clothes to Great Qing ourselves. So it's possible that the Austria-Hungary and the Austro-Hungarian Empire at, at this point in its development was actually double dipping into the British market, buying both our clothes directly from us, as well as through the Chinese. And they're importing 72 levels of grain from Great Qing, importing 57 levels of furniture from France. So the AI is absolutely participating in trade in the real world uh, here in Victoria 3. And they're doing it in a way that I, I think is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Yes, there is some value to specifically importing construction goods at the beginning of the game, but by the mid to late game, if you're especially if you're in free trade, you just want to trade for volume. You just want to trade for money. That's really all you care about. Though, of course, here as Austria-Hungary in 1895, they are still relying on hereditary bureaucrats. Oh, Austria-Hungary. Oh boy. And France here, looking at their technology, they have 50 innovation, which means they don't have a single academy built. But this is 1.1, so the AI was having some real issues in the game. Austria-Hungary at least has a small university in Austria, in Vienna. But I think that's probably one of the other things that's holding the AI back. If they are consistently not building any universities, then they're going to fall behind technologically. And that's also kind of the story here, is that we really are so far ahead of everybody technologically um, that they they can't keep up with us economically. And so I think the, the AI probably just needs a different way to think about how it, it acquires innovation and how it prioritizes innovation. But we are currently at 78.15 unspent innovation just because we've built so many universities to, incur, to ensure that we have uh, qualifications in all of our states. Oh, but Egypt, as, a, as the, the true final note, Egypt here has done incredibly well for itself despite having lost control of Syria during its wars with the Ottoman Empire, largely due to its connection to our market. And that's just because it's, it's been able to build away a good chunk of its peasants by utilizing our resources and our demand. They're down to 600,000 peasants versus 1.8 million gainfully employed. But here, just shifting over to Prussia, it's pretty clear that at least the AI is definitely capable of building universities because they're literally building them right now. So I think the, the AI is getting there for Victoria 3. Um, we'll see how 1.2 affects gameplay, but I'm really excited to, to be playing around with it. It looks very promising, and uh, I, I think that it's a good step in the right direction for the game. All right, that's, uh, that's Walker, and that's our retrospective episode of Her Majesty's Government here on We Play Games. Take care.